Hello again, I'm Sue Swinand. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. Today we're going to be talking about one of my very favorite poets, Stanley Kunitz. And we're also going to be showing you some of his uh, childhood home, which is right here in Worcester. And I'm very pleased to have as my first guest, poet and visual artist, Judith Ferrara. Uh, I have to tell you a little bit about Judy because she uh, has such a passion for poetry and such a wealth of knowledge on Kunitz that she's the perfect person to uh, be our guide in discussing his, his life. Um, Judy has been, was an educator for many years, a professor at, was at uh, Fitchburg State University and uh, in 1998 she returned to her passions for visual art and uh, became a full-time artist and poet and uh, working out of her studio here in Worcester, Mass. And uh, she's a published poet. Her first uh, book of poets was um, The Gestures of Trees and she's been published in many various publications. She's received the Jacob Knight Award in 2000 and the Culture, Worcester Cultural Commission Fellowship Grant in 2003. And if you want to know more about Judy, Judy, you can check out her website and see lots of her images uh, of her paintings. And uh, Judy, I want to welcome, thank you for having us today and uh, for all the work you've done in making this uh, house available to the public. It's my pleasure, Sue, and thank you for asking us to participate in this and, and get the word out on Stanley Kunitz because so many of us love his poetry and now that I work, have volunteered to work in the house over this last year and a half, uh, I used to love Stanley Kunitz's poetry, but I have come to know more about him through doing Sure, through that him. research will... First, before we go on, tell us your website so people can see your work and read some of your poems. Okay, um, it's palette and pen, P-A-L-E-T-T-E-A-N-D, P-E-N.com. And one of the things I do on my website is I also have a, a monthly blog on the creative process. So I do talk about painting and making art and writing poetry. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a wonderful outlet for me, um, just because I like to reflect on what I'm doing as sure. an artist and, um, and as a and writer. And you can bring that depth because of your interest in both poetry and visual art. So. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, how did so? When did you first get interested in Stanley Kunitz? Well, in the seventies, um, a book of his came out, *The Testing Tree*. And um, what I liked about that book, because I read a lot of poets, and I've loved poetry since childhood, is that Stanley returned to his childhood in a in a very explicit way. And uh, in my research, I found out that uh, in his interviews, he talks about that, that his, a visit to Worcester, after many years of not, not being near Worcester, uh, really inspired the poems in the testing tree. Unearthed all of that. Right. And Thomas Wolfe, you can't go home again. Well, Stanley did come home again for six decades of, of not uh, just stepping into this house, for example, and Carol will talk more about that. But it's this idea... Carol being the owner of the house, who we will speak to in a little bit. Right, Carol Stockmall, right. Um, so there's this idea of drawing me to his poetry uh, and relating in the way that uh, I, I... We all have memories of childhood, some of them not so good, some of them very good, but giving permission through uh, his poet's voice to step into his world, his childhood world, and facing the pain and facing the anguish. When you speak about the pain, what were some of the issues that were so poignant in his early childhood development? Well, his, in 1905, he was born in July, but two months previous to that, and those of you who know Worcester um, will understand uh, this, his, his father, um, two months before he was born, uh, Stanley was born, uh, committed suicide in Elm Park. And um, that was an event. So that, he never knew his father at all, who he died before he was born. That's right. And uh, it was a subject that was not 
brought up very much and or ever welcomed right. by I think uh, uh, you know I'd like you to read uh, do you want to read one of the poets about the death of his father I it might be a nice moment to read some actual writing of his sure do you is that I the can portrait? read the portrait okay and the portrait uh, happened um, in this house in the back hall where there are stairs going up to the third floor where the family had an attic uh, storage and some rooms up there. So, so this would have happened when he was about what age? Well, um, this incident that takes place in the poem, the portrait. When he's a young boy. So he's a yeah. young boy. And and he did live in this house from the time he was 14 until he was 20. Uh -huh. So within those, uh, those years. Okay. Um, the portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself, especially at such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with the pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word, and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek still burning. So those early childhood experiences influenced his work yes. strongly throughout yes, his career. And, um, and when he was nine years old, uh, his mother, Yetta, uh, remarried his beloved stepfather, Mark Dine. And uh, if you're talking about being able to face tragic uh, incidents in your life, in 1919 when this house was built on Woodford Street, um, they signed the mortgage on December 15th, and his beloved stepfather did that with his mother Yetta and uh, the co-owners upstairs. And on New Year's Day, 16 days later, Mark Dine, his beloved stepfather, dropped dead of a heart attack, hanging curtains in this front room. So he lost both fathers yes. and uh, but he was fortunate to have uh, Mark Dine for nine years. nine years because uh, from what I've read and from what you've told me his mother was a very wonderful powerful dedicated driving force but she was not a most loving soft individual. What What's the line about her Prickly breast. My or mother's something. breast was thorny. It's, My mother's breast was thorny. Yes. But so he was lucky to have love in his life through his stepfather, at least for that period. Yes. Uh, but uh, again, to have lost the stepfather must right. have been a terrible thing. And even though his mother uh, was more reserved and not affectionate, uh, she really encouraged Stanley as a poet. And um, when he announced as a nine year old he wanted to be a poet, um, she said, I thought you would be. This is it from an interview Tell with Stanley. Tell us a Stanley. little bit about the mother because she's such a dynamo. She is an amazing, amazing person in that here she is, uh, a, a, a pregnant woman, and she struggled. She was a dressmaker, and the home, uh, the businesses were on Green Street right here in And Worcester. a recent immigrant from, from Lithuania. Lithuania. Lithuania, and right. uh, really started out doing peace peace work in, right. in New York City, right? Well, um, yeah, pretty much she came to Worcester and and, yeah. uh, and worked here. Mm -hmm. So she was really um, a hard worker, and Stanley describes her as a businesswoman. And she ran her own business yeah. and made a go of it. She did. And developed the business to the point where she could build this house. Right, with Mark Dine. Yes. Her, her, her has husband, um, second husband, uh, just had, had this uh, Dine manufacturing company, dress manufacturing oh, uh -huh. company. So uh, they worked together to build that up. Okay. And then they were able, uh, renting in different places, but finally in 1919 able to build this house. Uh -huh. And while it's being built, uh, as you'll learn later, wonderful things 
We're happy. Tell us a little bit more about Stanley's uh, accomplishments and uh, a little bit of the history of other parts of his life. Well, uh, he uh, went to work um, in the late 20s, 1920s, for H.W. Wilson, reference uh, publishers, reference books. Yeah, I'm kind of interested to say that he wrote for the Telegram and Gazette. Though. Yes, he did before he left here. Actually, uh, he he sent the TNG, the Telegram at the time, uh, uh, when he was a um, student at Harvard University, uh, an essay of uh, his on James Joyce, just to show them he thought they could use a good writer on staff, and he they actually hired him. And then when he did graduate from Harvard and got his master's degree, he worked for a little, little under a year at the Telegram, and he had a feature, a Sunday feature, so he... I, I remember he reading that he, one of his assignments, of one of his features was interviewing uh, Goddard with yes. his crazy rocket. Yes. <laughs> what a background he has. I know. Yeah. So, so he He's that. really received almost every award a poet could receive, and uh, his really a poet laureate and, twice yeah right when back when the poet laureate yeah. was the consultant in poetry to the united states um so the he has poet laureate twice a pulitzer prize i mean just name the poetry prize a medal of medal of arts mm -hmm. from president clinton he just did everything i need to know a little bit about the uh historic uh things that have been happening with the house in terms of the docent program and things like that, and then we better wrap up. Okay. Uh, well, uh, when uh, Greg Stockmall, who used to do the docent tours between 2005 and 2008, passed away suddenly, it was Carol Stockmall's wish uh, to continue. And they were the owners of the house. Yes, and still are. Yes. And Carol still is. And uh, Carol wished to continue the uh, house tours, the docent tours, in order to maintain the legacy of Stanley Cunitz here in Worcester. This is the only house uh, that he lived in that is still standing. All the others have been tor torn down. And when Carol made that wish known to the Worcester County Poetry Association, I volunteered to um, interview her, look at documents, look at records. So you really did a lot of research on the house and prepared the material for the docents and helped Carol uh, Stockmall go through all the correspondence of 20 years. That was a fabulous, and you did that as a volunteer, is that correct? Yes. yes wow. Yes. And so tell us more about the uh, docent program and the dedication and so forth. Well, uh, the docent program, um, uh, it, when Carol opens the house to the public, the docents are available to give How often tours. is the house open? Well, once a year at this point, but also by appointment. And so we, there are groups that come through and um, uh, we give tours then, in fact. Coming up this week, we're going to be uh, giving some tours, but that's by appointment. But what, one of the things happened with the research was we had this this wonderful uh, collection of materials, almost 300 pieces. Wow! And Carol asked the question, "What what am I going to do with this original correspondence, uh, signed books, a whole uh, group of things that will help researchers would help researchers in the future understand?" Stanley here in Worcester and when what went on with this wonderful friendship that developed. And so Carol donated that collection to the Clark University Archives and Special Collections and that's where it is now. And a copy of the docent outline is included in those uh, items that are. So student groups could make an appointment and of course you can uh, go to the website for the Stanley Kunitz house and uh is am i does it have an official name other than that well the the best way to do that is to go to wcpa.homestead.com because the stanley units page is in, within the context of the worcester county poetry association's website well i just typed in stanley Cunitz home and it came right up did it yeah so you can find out all the details and make appointments for your class to come and see the house it's fabulous um, and uh, the, one of the great honors, if I could just talk about that very briefly, is in June uh, of this year, 2010, uh, the American Library Association designated for Woodford Street as a literary landmark. And at this point in time, uh, there are only five in Massachusetts and 110 in the nation. 
So we are very, very pleased that uh, that happened. And um, because it's fitting, if, if you're going to maintain a legacy of a writer, that is probably the best way to do it, is to have his boyhood home right here and tours available and uh, for to share with Right people. on Vernon Hill, 4 Woodward, Woodford Street. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Well, I can't wait to talk to Carol and get her personal stories about Stanley. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Steve. And now I would like you to meet photographer John Gauman, who uh, has done a remarkable job in recording uh, the readings of Stanley Kunitz for the Worcester County Poetry Association uh, as a volunteer over these many years. Um, how did you start with that and when? Well, the Poetry Association, um, back before the everybody had their own little cameras, needed somebody to keep a record of what was happening. And I volunteered to photograph Stanley whenever he came to Worcester. And I continued that even to when he went down to the Cape. And also, you did photography in this house. Yes. Um, and a lot of the images we're interspersing in this program are your work, are they not? Yes, they are. Yes. yes. So, uh, I understand that you're going to read a little something for us about the house, uh, well, which is the one you've chosen? The one I've chosen is because uh, one of the pictures uh, in the house shows a typewriter and a pair of Keds. And the Keds sneakers. were uh, Ked sneakers, right, for the old, the new people. But everybody knows Keds anyway. Uh, and it's from the testing tree. Uh, and I'm going to read the first stanza, which gives you an idea not only of Stanley coming home from school, but just how he was anxious to get back into the woods that were behind this house. Because originally, the house was one of only 12 on this hill, and everything around it was woods and open. So, the testing tree. On my way home from school up tribal Providence Hill, past the academy ballpark where I could never hope to play, I scuffed in the drainage ditch among the sodden seeth of leaves, hunting for the perfect stones rolled out of glacier time into my pitcher's hand, then lickety split on my magic keds from a crouching start, scarcely touching the ground with my flying skin as I poured it on for the prize of the mastery over that stretch of road where no one, nowhere to deny, when I flung myself down on the given course, I was the fastest human. Hmm. He was really quite a, an isolated child. In this, I, he doesn't refer to having many friends. Or... No, uh, he was an isolated child. And uh, the uh, thing that he would do is come home from school, read, uh, and if he read everything that was in the uh, family library, which was a very extensive library, uh, he would go down to the uh, library on Elm Street and take out his five allocated books and then, you know, read those through and go back when he was done. But he loved words, so if he found a word in a book, he would rush out into the woods and shout it uh, into the woods just to hear the word, you know, out in the open. Even if he didn't know exactly what it meant, it certainly was a nice sounding words. He and was born with that in his in it, his body. In his body, yes. Yeah, he, he was, talks so uh, much about was, the poetry coming from his body. He was a born yeah. poet. Yeah. Some people are born yeah. teachers, some people are born artists. He was a born and poet. And he was so grounded in the natural world. You know, I think some of his most special poems to me are the ones about animals, like the snake and the raccoon and they're well, just uh, well the the twining well, the twining braid of the snakes. Yes. He's, he the image yes. wonderful. Yes. yes, and that that book, uh, the wild braid. The wild braid yeah, is uh, was uh, oh, it has many uh, photographs that were. It's a book that's written about him in his garden yes. over a uh, three or four years. That's year one you would really enjoy. It's uh, personal conversations about his garden in Provincetown. And uh, which he tended until he was a hundred, but his deep connection to the natural world and growing things and all kinds of creatures, great and small, he was very in tune with the, with that yes. and almost a mystical sense of the natural world. 
the way yes. he wrote. Yes, and maybe when uh, Carol talks about the pear tree with you, which I think she may do later, uh, she might mention something mystical, two things maybe okay. about that pear tree. Oh, just one last question. Uh, the testing tree itself was an oak that he used to throw pebbles at? It, it was pebbles. like his own. These were his magic three stones. Oh, his magic three yes. stones, specially yes. picked. Yeah. But it was also it shows his his idea. He loved actually sport it was and, a, it was a, and athletics. A but he was thing. by himself. That's right. Testing yeah. himself. Testing himself for the three things that he wanted. Yeah. Was uh, love, poetry, and to live forever. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he almost did that. Almost <laughs> made 101. He, he did a, <laughs> made a good stab at it, that's for sure. Well, thanks, John. You're welcome, Sue. And now I'm very privileged to be able to introduce to you Carol Stockmall, who is the current owner of the house, and uh, she's our host today. And she's been living in this house for 30 years? Yes, th almost 31 years. And yes. uh, well, thank you so much for what you're doing here and uh, making this house uh, accessible to the public and, and for having us here. Um, and and you and your husband Greg started restoring the house in what? When did you buy the house? We bought the house in 1979. 79. 79. And it's been an ongoing project, <laughs> and it's still ongoing. Yeah. And you're trying to make it very much like it was in his day, and yes, this is an interpretation of what could have been here at the uh, at the at the time, at of, time his, of the twentieth century yeah, when he lived here in the early twentieth yes. century. Yes. So, uh, how did you actually come to know Stanley? What? How did you meet him? I. Well, we bought the house in 1979, and through the first years, uh, like 1980, my husband um, started clipping newspaper articles out of the paper about the poet and how he used to live on Woodford Street. And actually, my husband went down to the cellar one time, and he was poking around in the foundation uh, of the cellar, and he found this Band-Aid. And the Band-Aid said, Dine Manufacturing Company. So we started putting the and that Cunitz was Dine. Cunitz's and stepfather's exactly. company. Exactly. Yeah. But we didn't meet the poet until 1985. In, in 1989, he um, dedicated the poem that he wrote to us called My Mother's Pears because of the pear tree that Stanley and his mother planted in the backyard. Of this house? Yes. Which still stands there. Yes. And you can visit the garden in the back of the house. It's lovely. And the pear tree, uh, it, it's just a beautiful setting. You've done, you've done such nice things with the garden. Well, it was, it, it's, it's, it's a love affair with this house, actually. You know, it, it really is a labor of love. It so is. You couldn't begin to do this kind of work unless it were that. Right. It, it was before we met Stanley, but after we met Stanley and through the years, my husband and myself decided to perpetuate his legacy, and that's, and now uh, I'm alone, and I will still continue to do so. So you're really the, like the curator of this little museum, is well, what it amounts to. Yes, I am, and I, yeah. and I want to share this with yeah. the public. Well, you've got a wonderful home and a wonderful collection that you're so kind to share with the public. Uh, can we hear the pear tree now? Sure. So this poem, well, you'll hear it. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, this has to do with the pear tree that's standing in Carol's backyard as we speak. My mother's pears. Plump green gold, Worcester's pride. Transported through autumn skies in a box marked Handle with Care. Sleep 18 Bartlett pears, hand picked and polished and packed for deposit at my door. Each in its crinkled nest with a stub of stem attached and a single bright leaf like a flag. A smaller than usual crop, but still enough to share with me 
as always at harvest time. Those strangers are my friends, whose kindness blesses the house my mother built at the edge of town, beyond the last trolley stop when the century was young. And she proposed for her children's sake to marry again, not knowing how soon the windows would grow dark and the velvet drapes come down. Rubble accumulates in the yard. Workmen are hammering on the roof. I am standing knee deep in dirt with a shovel in my hand. Mother has wrapped a kerchief round her head, her glasses clint in the sun. When my sisters appear on the scene, gangly and softly tittering, she waves them back into the house to fetch us pails of water and they skip out of sight in their matching mini blouses. I summon up all my strengths to set the pear tree in the ground, unwinding its burlap shroud. It is taller than I. Make room for the roots, my mother cries. Dig the hole deeper. Oh man, I just love that last, the last two lines. Yes. Make room for the roots. Yes. Dig the hole deeper. It's almost like life came full circle from Stanley and his mother planting the pear tree and the stanza of um, no sooner how the, the windows would grow dark and yes. the velvet yes. drapes come down, yes. that's, um, that signifies the death of Mark Dine. His stepfather who only lived in this house for a very short time. Yes. Yeah. And then through um, actually the working, uh, the workmen working on the house and my husband and I sending him a box of pears from 2000, oh. from 2000 and, oh, I forgot. What a beautiful custom though to have. For 20 years. To have him have those pears that his mother planted. Isn't yes. that something? Yes. You know, but more than that, I think the last two lines when he talks about dig the hole deeper make room for the roots. It's really, to me, a metaphor for his whole motivation as a poet, and that his mother would be saying that to him. You know, it, it's almost like his contribution is to make our lives deeper, to make our experience and knowledge of life yes. the deeper he, he can show us. This has been such a wonderful experience. I can't thank you enough uh, for what you're doing here for the city and for Stanley and for poetry in general. And it's really, uh, as I say, a labor of love. It and is a labor of love. We appreciate all that you've done. And thank you so much for having us here in your home. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today. And we'll see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas.